out. Or a weighted average, more prices are going up and going down. But the price level, it's a construct. We use it as economists. It's important. But in a sense, it doesn't exist in the real world. What exists in the real world are individual prices. And, when we ha and as we'll see later on, when we have too much or too little money, the price level has to adjust. But even when we say that, we have to remember, it's not the price level. It's all individual prices adjusting. And it's those changes in relative prices that comprise the price level that really matter, as we'll see, for, the, the, for macroeconomic problems. Okay? And we'll also see, when we talk about this, that the Austrian concern with what we sometimes call injection effects or cantillon effects, the way in which money coming into the economy affects individual prices, is all tied up with this as well. Another piece of, of this, and you just heard about this in the last talk, so there's not much more I'm going to say. Um, and that's the time preference theory of interest, the idea of the interest rate as a price differential. Uh, time preference is necessary and sufficient for the existence of interest, but actual market rates, of course, reflect all kinds of different factors, other factors than time preference. But time preference is that essence of pure interest. Um, and this is important because the interest rate serves as a signal about people's intertemporal preferences. It indicates the degree to which people are patient and willing to wait, or the degree to which they're impatient and want things and want things now. So time preference uh, is key to this to this story about how monetary exchange works as micro foundations. Another piece of this puzzle is is the work that, of Mises and other Austrians, of course, on the idea of monetary calculation. And the key here is that the current array of prices in the marketplace help entrepreneurs and owners plan, helps them form their plans, form their budgets. It helps them decide on the actions they might take. It guides, they, those prices guide production decisions. But what's important, and, and uh, Professor Kirzner noted this this morning, and, and I'll talk more about it tomorrow, um, is that for this calculation, for this budgeting, for this whole process to take, for, to take place, prices have to be determined by the market. And I would argue, determined, reckoned in terms of money. You need money as a standard of, but money as a medium of exchange enables prices to have a standard of comparison, ways that it's meaningful to compare this price to that price when all trade against money. This is again a point raised in the calculation debate um, and that Mises really emphasized was that those prices that we're calculating based on are money prices, prices that emerge from monetary exchange. And you can tie lots of other things into this as well, the whole notion of capital and planning that, that Peter talked about some, um, the idea that entrepreneurial plans are inherently future-oriented. They need, entrepreneurs need prices, they need interest rates to, to engage in that calculation process. We can talk about the capital structure at any time as being a reflection of those in-progress, unfinished plans that are based on monetary calculation. And that's why this concept of intertemporal coordination is key. The challenge facing entrepreneurs is guessing what it is that people want in the future and deciding what kinds of production processes to undertake to make the stuff that people want in the future. And so all of those decisions, the whole capital structure, is based upon monetary calculation, which is in turn based upon the fact that prices, money prices emerge out of monetary exchange. Another bit of this, of course, is Hayek on prices and knowledge. The fact that we have monetary exchange that enables these prices to emerge also enables those prices to be socially accessible proxies for the underlying knowledge of actors. What prices do is they substitute for the detailed knowledge that people, that people have. Uh, okay, who, who people have that are contributing to the formation of those prices. Entrepreneurs can look at prices and glean information from them Okay? Use them as a proxy, as a substitute for that underlying information. Prices help this in that way, this is the Hayekian point, coordinate that process. Let me emphasize two things here. One, three things actually. One, it's not just prices, right? There's, the, I think, misreadings of Hayek that say, where Hayek says, oh, all you need are prices. No, right? Entrepreneurs, prices are helpful, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. Entrepreneurs still need their judgment, their ability to make guesses about the future, what Mises called thymological knowledge, their sort of you know, folk psychology of other people. All those sorts of things are part of this process. And Hayek nowhere says you only need prices. Okay? The other point I'd make here is that calculation, this whole process of monetary calculation, is about money prices, about prices that emerge from monetary exchange. Prices that you just invent out of thin air or that are invented by a central planning board don't 
do the job. You need the actual process of exchange to make those prices meaningful. And the third thing I'd say is to emphasize a kind of running theme so far this week. These two things are two sides of the same process. This is not a difference that matters between these two. This is two, what Mises focused on was the micro foundations element and Hayek is focusing on the broader consequences in terms of how prices enable order to emerge in the marketplace. Okay? So, so these two things are, again, I think highly compatible. And finally, uh, Kersnerian entrepreneurship is part of this process too. It's, it's the Kersner entrepreneur. He says it's the Mises entrepreneur. It's the Kersner entrepreneur um, who, who does the job of using those money prices to formulate those plans. And importantly, the, reli the reliability of those money prices will affect the quality of entrepreneurial decision making and therefore the degree of coordination of, of order we, we achieve. To the extent that some kind of disturbance in the economy affects the whole array of money prices and makes those money prices less reliable signals. It makes it harder for people to calculate. It undermines entrepreneurship and therefore it undermines economic performance. Okay? Everybody see that? If, if, if you have a disturbance that makes prices less reliable, people can't calculate as well, entrepreneurs can't do their job as well, economic growth suffers. And Mises wrote in his, in, in his 1920 article on calculation under socialism, Mises wrote the following, this is a quote, admittedly monetary calculation has its inconveniences and serious defects, but we certainly have nothing better to put in its place and for the practical purposes of life monetary calculation as it exists under a sound monetary system always suffices. And I emphasize as it exists under a sound monetary system. Mises understood that if there's something wrong with the monetary system that's going to affect prices and that's going to undermine the effectiveness of monetary calculation. And so you can kind of see maybe where we're headed here, right? Which is, okay, what sorts of things will make that broad macro environment more, better or worse? What sort, of things will, what sort of things will undermine those prices? What sorts of things won't? And again, you can almost, you can see, if you know the Austrian cycle theory and so on, you can see that this is a way to read the Austrian cycle theory, right, as, as how inflation undermines the signaling processes, signaling functions of prices and interest rates. Again, I'll, I'll kind of loop my way back to that. I do want to take a minute or two and compare this sort of, this is, if you want to think of it, this is the Austrian micro foundations, right? Well, if you want to talk about macroeconomics from an Austrian perspective, you need to understand all those bits of micro foundations here to do so. And we can compare that to the way sort of mainstream economics, general equilibrium, talks about these, these issues, or at least similar ones. Uh, and just, I'm going to just say a few things here. In a general equilibrium world, it's very, very difficult to talk about money in any meaningful sense. One reason is that the assumption, in at least the canonical general equilibrium models, is that all goods are equally liquid, that all goods are equally tradable. And if every good is equally liquid, equally tradable, equally marketable, there's no way to generate a meaningful money. Remember, Menger's story depends upon people realizing that some goods are more marketable, more easily saleable, more desired than others. But general equilibrium rules that out, at least, again, the canonical models rule that out by assumption. And so it's hard to generate money in a general equilibrium model. And therefore, also in a general equilibrium model, whatever the prices are in that model are not money prices. They're prices that emerge somehow a different way, which I'll come back to in just a minute. A second problem with those general equilibrium frameworks is that they are essentially models of barter. Okay? At best, money, if you want to call it money, <laughs> uh, is what, what is called in those models a numeraire. It's the one good we separate out and, and, in essence, use as our standard of comparison against all the other goods to talk in terms of relative prices, right? If you, again, know these models, we, it's PY over PX, and we decide that we're going to compare all the other goods to X, and therefore we have at least something we're comparing everything to. It kind of looks like what we were talking about before. But notice, there's no real exchange here. And, in fact, in general equilibrium models, uh, prices are set before exchange takes place. Right? That the auctioneer ensures that price determination is distinct from any process of exchange. Prices are finalized before goods change hands in those models. What role can there be for money and what effects could it have 
if that's how you're setting up the model. For Austrians, prices are emergent phenomena. They derive out of monetary exchange rather than being parameters to decision making. Sure, prices inform our current decisions, but those decisions don't take prices as given. In fact, what entrepreneurs do is to imagine, as Kersner argued, different prices. In GE models, neither money nor prices can emerge from exchange because they, there is no money and prices have to be set before that exchange takes place. So for Austrians, prices, money prices, emerge out of, they are the dependent variable, not the independent variable. Um, and the other thing I'd say, that oftentimes you s one point of language confusion here is this term relative prices. We Austrians like to talk about relative prices too. Um, in, in GE models they talk about relative prices, but it's always again this sort of notion of PY over PX, right, the price of one good in terms of the other. For Austrians, relative prices are still money prices. We're still concerned about comparing the prices of good X versus good Y, because what matters is how expensive one thing is against another. But we recognize that those are money prices. They're prices that have emerged out of monetary exchange. And the only way we can really know that those prices are meaningful is because real people have traded real goods against real money to generate, to generate those prices. The last point I make, again, this is one you've, I think, heard already. In the GE models, what, we're ha what we have here is maximization, not monetary calculation. Okay? Individuals within these models uh, know what they need to know. We had, you know, Kersner had the, had the indifference curve and the, and the budget line up there and sort of, you know, made, made this point, right? Think about his decision-making room, right? You go step out for a cup of coffee, we'll tell you what, you what you decided, okay? And the way I put that is there's no decision. There's no deciding there, right? Your, your choice in, the, in these models is implied by the data. You don't choose. Once you know the data, you know what people will do, okay? And um, it's, again, it's the auctioneer, not exchange, who creates prices in these models, and prices, again, are independent variables only. They're not emergent. They're not dependent variables. They don't come out of the process. So these are very different vision of the micro foundations, of, of, of a very different uh, vision of how, how prices in, in emerge than we see in the, in, in the Austrian story. Okay? So, where does that, how does that get us to macroeconomics? All right, well, if we sort of put all this stuff together for a minute, okay, we can begin to see this point about money as the medium of exchange and time as the medium of production. And that macroeconomics is, again, the economics of time and money. When we say uh, money is the medium of exchange and, and, uh, and, and time is the medium of production, What's, I think, powerful about that is that we normally think about production and exchange as being micro-phenomena. One of the great micro-textbooks of all time was Alchin and Allen's Exchange and Production, right? That's microeconomics. okay? But the point Austrians emphasize here is that production activity, because it takes place through time, has macroeconomic implications. Specifically, both money and time are pervasive across the entire economy. Every act of production involves time. Every act of exchange involves money. And therefore, time and money link our micro choices with macroeconomic outcomes. They're pervasive across every element of the economy. So they're about micro choices, but they have macro, system wide, economy wide implications. And more specifically, where do money and time intersect? What's, where's the place within the economy that money and time intersect? And the answer here is in the banking system and the capital structure. And I think this is a really, really important point. And this is a point that you'll hear Roger Garrison make in his two lectures later in the week. But let me sort of preview it now. Okay, Think back for a moment I think you assume you've all had it. Think back to intermediate, your intermediate macro theory course. Do you remember what the one bit of microeconomics you did in intermediate macro probably was? The market that, that links micro and macro in most, in most uh, neoclassical models? What was it? Probably did it early in the semester. 
was the one bit of micro. Labor markets. Who said labor markets? Give yourself a gold star. Labor markets, right? Labor markets, for most of the 20th century, have been that bridge between micro and macro. And really since Keynes, and it's Keynes' work, right, and the emphasis on unemployment in Keynes that made, that, that, that made labor that bridge. And Roger Garrison refers to those models as labor-based macro. Well, Austrians, for Austrians, the link between micro and macro ultimately is capital. And what Austrians do is capital-based macroeconomics. Because the, the intersection of time and money is capital. And the activities of the banking system that translate savings into investment and generate capital in the capital structure. That's where the bridge is for Austrians. That's why the, the, the subtitle of Roger's book, Time and Money, is capital-based macro. Again, I don't want to steal too much of his, of his talk from later in the week. But the key point here to recognize, then, is that if time and money are right, whatever that means, then the microeconomic discovery process will do as well as it can. If, if this is working, if time and money are doing their jobs, if the banking system is doing its job appropriately, then everything else, all the, the rest of the economy that's based on that interest rate signal, on having the right, whatever that means, quantity of money in play, those things will work themselves okay, out okay. If they're wrong, there will be pervasive, systematic, and problematic effects. Later in the week, I'm going to do a talk on inflation that will explore this in a lot more detail even than I'll talk about today. But if they're wrong, you'll have these sort of pervasive systematic effects. Another way to put this is, is that macroeconomic error has microeconomic consequences. One of my favorite Roger Garrison quips is that there are macroeconomic problems, but only microeconomic solutions. And that, I, that quip, by the way, has never been more policy relevant uh, than the last nine months. Right? If you think about all the ways in which people think we need to solve this recession through macroeconomic, and we need more consumption, more this, more that, when in fact the problem is prices are wrong. Okay? We we'll need, need to allow markets to adjust themselves at the microeconomic level. The problem here is, mic is the microeconomic distortion of resources. Where monetary exchange and the use of capital characterize microeconomic processes, fluctuations in money and in interest rates will have macroeconomic effects. But the effects of those errors will be at the micro level because they affect the calculation process that makes use of those prices and all the entrepreneurship and so on that flows from that. And, and a, a misleading interest rate will affect the way in which entrepreneurs engage in that calculation. What you see here is when money and time are wrong, when we have macroeconomic distortions, they disrupt the microeconomic price coordination process. All macroeconomic disturbances are ultimately caused by problems with money, that money time nexus. Okay? And all are agglomerations of microeconomic errors. If you think about the Austrian business cycle theory story, what is it but, a but else but a sequence of microeconomic distortions that come from a macro disturbance? And this Austrian focus on, mo on monetary calculation and the epistemic property of prices provides us with a better, I would argue, micro foundations for macroeconomics. So what does this suggest then in terms of sort of pol thinking about policy? Well, I think what it suggests is that when we think about money and time, when we think about capital markets, when we think about monetary policy or monetary institutions, that the first rule should be, first, do no harm. That what we want to do is create the right institutional framework that will allow the microeconomic process to unfold unhampered. But then the question is, okay, how do we know when money's right? What does it mean to say we have the right quantity of money? And how will that affect interest rates and so on? And that set of questions is the second half of, wow, even right at 2.30, look at that. Okay? The second half of my talk is to now look at this question of, all right, what's the right quantity of money and how does it relate back to these micro foundations? 
And for this, we're going to explore what's known as the monetary equilibrium tradition and the mon monetary equilibrium theory. So let me kind of give you a quickie little outline of the second half of this talk. I want to talk a bit about who and what the monetary equilibrium theory tradition is. I want to define monetary equilibrium, and that's going to take us a little bit of time to work through some of the details there. I want to talk about the ways in which monetary equilibrium can be used as a guide to policy. Okay? In other words, why, what does this tell us about what good monetary policy might look like? And then I want to talk a little bit about the two possible monetary disequilibria that we could get. I'm going to say just a very few words about inflation and Austrian cycle theory. You're going to have numerous detailed discussions of that later in the week. I want to say a little bit about deflation, what's sometimes called the Vixellian rot. And then I want to end by talking about the question of the price level and the productivity norm. That is, what, should we, what do we imagine the price level will do in an economy where the money supply is right? Does that mean price stability? Or does it mean something else? So that's the, that's the second half. Okay? All right, so the monetary equilibrium tradition. Who, what are these folks? Well, this was a line of thought in monetary theory. I would argue that really begins with Newt Vixell, the very uh, famous uh, Swedish economist, and wrote at the turn of the opening of the 20th century. Vixell, uh, by the way, is the person responsible for the concept of the natural rate of interest that is so central to, to, what, uh, to Austrian cycle theory. There's no doubt uh, that Mises, for example, was writing within and grappling with the ideas of Vixell, was roughly a contemporary of his, uh, in Mises' work in, in Theory of Money and Credit and other kinds of places. And so there's a, a healthy group of folks we might identify in here, and I'll mention a few. Uh, Vixell and Mises, I think, belong in here. Um, there are the so-called American monetary disequilibrium theorists, um, uh, uh, Harry Brown, uh, Davenport, Clark Warburton. These are sometimes called the early American monetarists. That's another name they go by. People writing really before the Great, or up to the Great Depression, uh, who adopted this, this uh, framework. There were later Swedish thinkers here. Gunnar Myrdal, who we normally don't think about as being you know, someone we're, we're, we count uh, uh, in Austrian-friendly circles, uh, given some of his later work. But Myrdal's work on monetary theory was in this tradition and is very useful. Uh, one of the most, one of the great, fun, bizarre, crazy economists uh, ever, D.H. Robertson, Dennis Robertson. If you've ever tried to read Dennis Robertson's work, um, it's, it's very difficult to read. He kind of is in, has his own language, his own way of talking about things. Um, but he was a brilliant contemporary of Hayek and Keynes uh, on the right side of most of those issues, though he, had, he framed things a little bit differently than Hayek did. But he was a, Robertson was a tremendous anti-Keynesian. There's something, by the way, about monetary theorists that make them sometimes adopt their own language. Another good example of this, and I would include this person roughly in this tradition too, is, uh, is William Hutt, the great South African economist of the 20th century. Hutt also had his own sort of language and way of talking about these things, but he too was in this same, this same, uh, this same group. And I think also then, again, I mentioned Mises, but I think many of the Austrians fall into this. I think you can make the case I'm in the middle of a debate on the Austrian economist blog as we speak about whether Hayek falls into this tradition. I believe he does. I think I can make that argument. What I'll note here and maybe come back to later, and you can certainly raise it in the Q&A, is who doesn't fit into this tradition. And I think within Austrian economics, there is a Rothbardian tradition in monetary theory that does not fit in, that rejects this monetary equilibrium tradition. That takes, I think the, the, the best way to view it, I think, is to see Rothbard as taking a different interpretation of some things that Mises said and sort of coming out into a, into a different strand of thought and that ties back to some other thinkers from earlier in the 20th century out of a very different tradition. And I'm again happy to, I'll mention this a little bit later again too, but I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A. And one of the great disagreements among Austrian economists right now uh, are debates over whether this monetary equilibrium tradition or this more Rothbardian tradition is the more appropriate way for Austrians to be talking about monetary issues. Um, I hate saying this because it will, it will guarantee to bring up the question later on, but so be it. It's also tied into the debate over free banking and 100% reserves, which is another big internal debate among Austrians. And those two things are the monetary equilibrium folks tend to be in favor of free banking, while the, uh, while the Rothbardian theor monetary theorists, from that perspective, uh, is linked up with their preference for 100% reserves. But again, that's, that's 
things we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, uh, again, so Mises, Hayek, I would include in here. Uh, there's textual evidence. The other point I want to mention here is the role of this concept of neutral money and, and, and the neutrality of money. And again, this is a this is a concept that we see knocked around in the mainstream and among Austrians a lot. And I think it, it has multiple meanings. It's one of the most confusing terms that we use in monetary theory as Austrians try to talk to non-Austrians. The way it's used in mainstream theory is to describe a money whose introduction has no effect on the structure of relative prices. Okay? That it refers to money as a whole, money as a good, money, money as an institution is neutral in this sense. And more specifically, money is neutral if you say double the money supply, each and every price doubles. And there's no effect on relative prices from changes in the money supply. And again, that's a particular way that it gets, it gets used. Hayek, though, had a little bit different usage of this term, which was, to ha which was a more, I would call it a more policy-oriented use, which was that neutrality was a, pro a property of monetary policy or monetary regimes, even better, to say, how do we, wh under what sort of monetary system would money not exercise a deleterious influence on price formation? That is, can we imagine a system in which which money facilitates price formation through monetary exchange, but does it influence that in a problematic way that does the best it can to make sure those prices continue to tell the truth, to signal well. And that when we think about monetary policy, we don't want money to become an independent source of disruption of that price formation process, of interference. The analogy Hayek sometimes used was um, that money, that, that, that uh, money inflation uh, can cause uh, static in a telecommunication system, right? It's like it, it, you can't, when you have a static radio signal, you can't quite really hear what it's saying as well as if there's no static. What we want to do is have a monetary system, monetary institutions that avoid creating static. I think that's a, a, an effective way to think about it. So a property of monetary policy or monetary institutions, not money itself. And finally, ideally what we want to do is avoid inflation and deflation. Now, whether that means the price level should be stable, I'll talk about at the end when we talk about the productivity norm. But, but certainly part of this monetary equilibrium tradition was how do we avoid inflation and deflation and what exactly does that mean? Okay? And does it mean that the price level is necessarily stable? Okay? All right. Now, what I want to do is now sort of define what exactly we mean by monetary equilibrium. And as the name suggests, we're looking at the, an equilibrium between the supply and demand for money. In this way, we're viewing money like any other good in the economy. Where ideally what we want is a monetary system that produces the quantity of money that, and this is important, that the public wishes to hold at the current price level. And that phrase at the current price level is important for reasons I'm going to sort of loop back to shortly. Because you might, again, if you've read other Austrian stuff or other kinds of things, you might have heard the argument made that any quantity of money is optimal. Right? That any quantity of money can serve the needs of, of, the, of the economy, of the public. That's true if you're willing to allow the price level to change, and if, the, and if the changing price level, you don't believe, causes any problems. Think of it, I mean, I, in, in one sense, right, if we doubled the money supply in the United States, which we've basically done over the last year by some measures, but suppose we doubled, you know, in your pockets, and your bank accounts, doubled the money supply, right? I could say, well, that new money supply, that, that, that's optimal. It'll work just fine as long as we allow prices to double as well. And you why say, well, hold on a second, right? Isn't that a problem if we allow prices to double? Yeah. Okay, what if I said, well, we could get by with half the amount of money if, we, you know, if we're willing to allow prices to drop in half. And I'm, I would say doing that would be problematic too. Okay? So this definition says, look, given the price level, right, given that we don't want those dramatic changes in the price level, how much money are people willing to hold at the current price level? That's how much money we should be supplying. That's what the monetary system should, should be doing. And the other point I want to make here is that the demand for money, so actually let me back up for a second. The, 
The, my point about the price level changing is that monetary disequilibrium is a short run phenomenon. Once you allow prices to change, you'll always get back to a new equilibrium. And I'm going to show this graphically in a minute. Okay? But monetary disequilibria are short run. Eventually, prices will change. And when prices will change, as I'll, as I'll show, you'll get back to some new equilibrium. The problem is that all the bad stuff happens well, in those price changes. That's the point we're making before. We don't want money to be an, uh, uh, an independent cause of changes in prices. That's where problems are uh, derived from. The other point to make real quick, just a reminder, is that the demand for money is a demand to hold real money balances. You demand money when you hold it, not when you spend it. If, if you ask me what's Horowitz's demand for currency right now, I'm going to take out my wallet, I'm going to count $81, okay? That's my current demand for currency. If I go down the street and, and, and buy a tank of gas, I'm reducing my demand for money, increasing my demand for gasoline. Same with your bank account, right? What you keep in your bank account is your demand for money. When you spend it, you reduce your demand for money because you're increasing your demand for something else. So again, what do we want? We want the supply of money equal to, de equal to the demand to hold it at the current price level. And by the way, this point about money demand is, this is a, a key, one of Mises' key advances in monetary theory is understanding this cash balance approach to the demand for money. Uh, if you haven't read, if you're interested in these things and haven't read Theory of Money and Credit, that should be near the top of your reading list. Uh, much of this is in there, uh, and, and, and much of the Austrian understanding of monetary theory comes out of that book. Equality between the supply and demand for money, that is maintaining monetary equilibrium, implies, I'm going to argue, that the market rate of interest is equal to the natural rate of interest. And again, I'll define those uh, in, in, in just a second. The market rate of interest is the rate that banks are charging for loans. If you go to the bank and say, I want to take out a loan, what are they charging? That's the market rate of interest. The natural rate of interest is Again, another analytical construct here. We can't do monetary theory without them. That's the rate of interest that reflects people's underlying time preferences. That's the rate of interest. The natural rate is the real fact of people's patience, of how much people are willing to wait or not wait. What are their real time preferences? And you can see, right, that we, would, that we ideally want an economic system in which these two things are equal. Why? Because then the actual rate being charged, and again I say the rate, but we know there's an array of different rates of interest. But the rate of interest being charged, if these two are equal, the rate of interest that banks are charging is accurately reflecting people's underlying time preferences. That is, the market rate is a reliable signal about those underlying time preferences. That's what we want. And what I want to argue is, is if we get this right, we're going to also get get that right, okay? And the key to seeing that, the key to understanding that, is that what banks do is that banks intermediate time in the form of money. We cannot trade time with one another. And if you want to think about it this way, if you're someone, if you, want to, if you have extra resources and you want to save, okay, you're willing to wait. You don't want to consume all your, re all your resources now, right? If you're willing to wait, what are you doing? You really want to sell some Time. You, want to get, you want to give up time. You want to give it to someone else. You don't need it because you're willing to wait. And then there's all these entrepreneurs out there who would really like to get some time. They'd like to move resources closer to them in time so that they can invest now. They know, they hope anyway, that they'll have proceeds later on to pay off the loan. But those are the impatient ones. They want stuff now. You are willing, let's say you're, you're, you're a household with savings, you're willing to wait. So we want to organize a trade. We'd like to be able to trade the time I don't need for the time the other person needs. But we can't literally trade time. How do we do it? We do it in the form of money. By my putting money in the bank, I give the bank resources that it can then transfer to the borrower. Right? In essence, I've said, I'll wait. Take my money. Give me interest. <laughs> right? The bank or the borrower says to the bank, gimme, gimme, gimme. I need resources now. Bank does it, charges them interest. That's how financial intermediation works. But the, the thing you have to remember from an Austrian perspective is that the money changing hands isn't really the key. The key is that we're moving resources through time. 
And that's why the banking system, why Austrians spend so much time talking about the banking system. It's in the banking system that interest rate signals get generated, time is the medium of production, and, and it is through money that those can be influenced. It's the existence of money that allows the separation between these two things. We don't talk about the market price of shoes and the natural price of shoes, right? Money markets, this is again about money being different in this way, right? But it's, but what, or time being different, right? But we can't trade time directly and so we have this process where it transforms into money, but that allows leakage to slip in, right? This is high, this is the language of loose joint. It's like a loose joint here, right? Again, uh, Roger will talk a lot more about that. But that's, that's, what's, that's one way of, of, of looking at this. It's also true, if these two things are equal, and it'll help us understand this in a minute, that savings and investment are equal. And I use the phrase ex ante, savings and investment. That's desired savings and investment. And one of the reasons I use this is, again, where's our, you know, everyone's taking intermediate macro, okay? When you think about intermediate macro for a minute, what are the two curves in that old model that you talk about? There's the LM curve, IS curve, okay? IS is investment and savings. How, what's the key assumption to define the IS curve? Who remembers? Say it again. Two gold stars, I think. Say it again. Savings and investment are equal at every point. Savings and investment are equal at every point along that curve. Very good. Okay. And how is that defended? Well, the usual defense, and it's a Keynesian construct, says, hey, whatever is invested must have been saved. If I borrowed, someone else had to lend resources. Right? It's got to be equal. That's an ex post, the, after the fact, equality of investment and savings. In that model, IS, I, that ISLM model, there's no way for investment and savings to ever not be equal. They're equal by construction. They can't ever diverge. And that divergence is key, as we'll see in, as you know, the Austrian cycle theory story. That the, the possibility that these will diverge is key. But they can't even diverge in the Keynesian model. And part of that is the Keynesian model defines these two things after the fact. It's like saying there can never be disequilibrium in a market in a shoe market because, well, if we sold 50 million shoes last year, 50 million people must have bought shoes, therefore equilibrium. That's not what equilibrium means. Equilibrium means that desired, that plans are in coordination. Of course, I mean, you could put a price control on a market, the number of shoes sold, actually sold, will equal the number of shoes actually bought. Duh, it's tautological. All right? The problem is when they're divergent ex ante, where people's plans don't match up, that's when trouble arises. And what I want to, what the monetary the equilibrium theory tradition argues is, is if you get this right, you get this right. And, and let me make the argument. It requires a little bit, I think, of, of simplification. But the easiest way to see it is that um, the demand for money understood as a demand to hold the liabilities of banks, that is to have money in a checking account, or in the old days to have a bank note, right? But think about money in your checking account. That's a liability of the bank, okay? That as you put more into that account, as you save more, you're holding more money. So there's a link between your savings, your, su your supplying loanable funds, basically, and your holding of money. In turn, when banks provide funds to entrepreneurs for investment, they're creating money. That the money supply has a relationship for the funds available for firms to use for investment. If the banking system is doing this, matching, say, matching, the, matching the money that they're producing with the public's demand to hold it, by implication, with some simplifications, by implication, they are turning the public savings into, that, into the desired amount of investment, again, at, at the current interest rate. All right? So that there is a link between these two things and these two things. This is one of the more complex and somewhat controversial claims here. But if you think about money not as currency today, but as bank liabilities, checking account dollars, as you save more, you're holding more money. That allows the bank to create more for investment. So if these two things are equal, these two things are equal. And if these two things are equal, the market rate and the natural rate are equal. If ex ante savings and investment, if people's plans are in coordination, that means the actual rate of interest is accurately reflecting 
their underlying time preferences. So in monetary equilibrium, these two things are equal, these two things are equal, those two things are equal. This implies the other two. Hmm? And if that's all true, we're doing what we want to be doing in terms of policy. If that's all true, we're avoiding excess supplies and demands for money. Excess supplies of money, just another word for inflation. One way, this is a monetary equilibrium definition of inflation, that inflation is an excess supply of money. And deflation is an excess demand for money, right? Or an uh, insufficient supply, if you want to think about it that way. Notice, by the way, that defining inflation as an excess supply of money is not the same thing as defining inflation as any increase in the, in the money supply. By this definition, some increases in the money supply are appropriate. For example, and we'll talk about this in a minute, if the demand for money rises, monetary equilibrium theory says the, the supply of money should rise to match it. Because if you don't, you'll wind up with an excess demand for money and deflation and the problems associated with it that I'll talk about shortly. Either one of those situations of monetary disequilibrium, inflation, deflation, have microeconomic consequences. They do their harm by disrupting that price coordination process that I talked about at the beginning. And the key to seeing this is the following. If you have an excess supply or demand for money, there's two ways to solve that problem. One is to allow the price level to adjust. That's sort of what I suggested earlier. But the other is to change the nominal supply of money to remove the problem. If the demand for money goes up, and I'm going to show this graphically in just a second. If the demand for money goes up and now exceeds the supply, you've got two choices. We'll see. You can allow the price level to fall. That'll even things out. Or you can increase the nominal money supply as a response. Two possibilities. What the monetary equilibrium theorists argue is that price level adjustments are, are the worst of the, those two solutions. Neither one's perfect. Okay? But these are, the wor these are the worst of the two because they're, so, they're socially costly because what they involve are serious relative price changes and, and other systematic effects that we can talk about too. That price level adjustments are much more problematic, goes the argument, than nominal money supply adjustments. All right? and let, let me show this graphically. This is my one bit of fancy technique uh, for the week. And, and hopefully that will help maybe clarify this. Okay? What we have here along the horizontal axis is money. We can talk about supply or demand here, but M for money. Along the vertical axis, we have 1 over P, uh, or 1 over the price level. And that's another way of thinking about the value of money, right? If the price level goes up, right? 1 over P goes down, money is less valuable. If the price level falls, 1 over P goes up, the, money, the value of money is higher. It's a sort of cheater's way of thinking about the price of money, but notice I've used the word the value of money. By the way, again, intermediate macro quiz number three. When, when you do the little diagram in intermediate macro and you put money down here, what usually goes in the vertical axis? I heard it. Interest rates, right. Once again, a Keynesian construction uh, about the belief about where what the demand for money is based on and what interest rates are determined by. The Keynesian assumption is, is that supply, the intersection of supply and demand in the money market determine interest rates. Austrians, all Austrians, monetary equilibrium or otherwise, as well as monetarists would say, well, monetarists depends which, which day of the week, would say it's the price level, it's the value of money that, that is determined there. All right, so, again, I didn't do this with fancy PowerPoint like Roger's going to do, but imagine you sort of start here with this demand for money curve and this su fixed supply of money, okay? So we're at equilibrium point zero there. All right, got my, whoops. That was bad. There we go. Where's my little pointer? Oops, that's not it. Oh, well, it's out here somewhere. All right, anyway, we'll, we'll ignore the pointer. All right, so we started at our little equilibrium point zero here. Imagine that the demand for money rises and we move out 
temporarily to point A. Pretend this second money supply curve doesn't exist yet. We're, we're in disequilibrium here at point A. We're out stuck on this money demand curve out in the middle of nowhere here. What are our options? Okay. Well, if we do nothing, as it turns out, the price level will fall, which means 1 over P will rise, and we'll work our way back up here, back to this new equilibrium point here. Right? Our other option is to expand the money supply in, in essence, turn A into a new equilibrium point without any movement in the price level. And the argument is, is that those movements in the price level are so problematic, right? Because you, you might say, well, what's really the difference between A and A prime? They're both equilibrium points, right? And I could, you know, I could say, you know, what's the big deal here? So the, the demand for money went up, prices fall. We're back, we're back to where we were before, right? We're just at a new equilibrium point. Right? Think about, think about imp, uh, an increase in the money supply in, in sort of you know, s standard neoclassical models, okay? You increase the money supply, prices go up by the same amount as the money supply, everything's back to where it was before, what's the big deal? Okay? If you just look at the two equilibria, you might say, well, what does it matter? The point I want to make is it matters a lot because the process, the disequilibrium process of going here to here is problematic. It dis for reasons, again, I'll explore in detail in just a minute, but it disrupts that price mechanism in, in the process. By responding here with an increase in the nominal money supply, we avoid those price level increases. We prevent that, that, that process from, from disrupting prices in that way. Okay? So, again, you can see there's two options here. You can respond to any situation of disequilibrium, of monetary disequilibrium, by a shift in the money, nominal money supply curve or by allowing the price level to work itself out. The problem is, is that, that's, that working itself out is problematic. Okay? Just think about inflation because it's probably easier to see with inflation. If we expand, you know, if, if we, why is, why is expanding the money supply, you know, if we started here and we just decided to expand the money supply, why would that be, why would that be a problem? Okay? Well, what people have this extra money, they spend it, that drives prices up. Right? Eventually, prices rise enough so that people are happy with the new money supply. End of story. Right? Well, no, we want to say that's not the end of the story because those prices rising, that process by which prices rise, causes all kinds of disruptions in the economy. It generates the cycle. So we just, with inflation, Austrians usually say, well, we don't want to just let prices rise, even though that will, in the long run, eliminate the disequilibrium. And what monetary equilibrium theorists argue, same with changes in the demand for money. So let me, I'm getting a little short on time. Let me jump ahead. I just want to say, again, a few quick things about inflation and, and deflation. Um, in my lecture on inflation later in the week, I'll talk a lot more about various costs and, and consequences, okay? But as I just was suggesting, once you recognize that the way in which inf that an excess supply of money translates into a, a rising price level is through people spending those excesses. You have more money than you wish to hold during an inflation, right? You might say, how is that possible? Well, you, you know, money's not the same as wealth. You can have, if, you want, if I want to go buy gasoline, I have more money than I wish to hold. I wish I was holding less money and more gasoline. And during an inflation, people find themselves with too much money. What do they do with it? They spend it. That drives up the price level. But as they spend, they don't spend evenly on all these different goods. Different people spend in different ways. Different people have different marginal utilities of money, different marginal utilities of different goods. Money, the particular path that money takes will be all over the place. And that means that not all prices will be affected the same. Some prices will go up by a lot, some by a little. That changes relative prices. That makes some goods look more profitable than others. Resources get deflected into some goods, not others. And all of a sudden, the whole economy, as a result of this inflation, begins to turn. And this is, Mises referred to this as a price revolution. I think it's a wonderful phrase. This price revolution means that the whole economy is going to change. That all of these, these movements in prices mean that uh, all kinds of re resource reallocation and misallocation. Again, I'll talk more about that, uh, about that later on. And Roger's going to talk about Austrian cycle theory, which is one particular story here when we start to think about what 
this does to the interest rate and how that affects patterns of production that emerge out of, out of, this, uh, out of this as well. Um, one thing I'd say here real, real, real quickly, two things I'd say. One, one way to think about the Austrian inflation story is that prices don't change perfectly and smoothly, right? Prices move in this ragged way during inflation. There's, do you want, it, it, I like to say they're sticky upward, okay? Which is a weird thing to think. We talk about sticky downward prices. These are sticky upward. They don't all move just the same exact way. It's not a smooth upward movement. That's what causes the resource misallocation. The other thing I note here, by the way, is that you can get all the same effects if the demand for money falls significantly uh, against the constant supply of money. You'll have too much money out there. It'll get spent. It'll generate all these same kinds of effects. That's why inflation is defined in this tradition as an excess supply of money, not just an increase in the money supply. I should say also that um, though I'm treating inflation and deflation as mirror images of each other here, that doesn't mean they have equal weight in the real world, right? We know in the real world that inflation is a much bigger problem than deflation, mainly because government central banks have every incentive in the world to err on the side of inflation and reduce the value of their own debts than they do on deflation. But deflation does happen. We've seen it, okay? So it's not irrelevant. Okay, but as a practical matter, it's certainly less crucial than inflation. But as a theoretical matter, we want to make sure that we talk about both. So what happens during deflation? All right. Well, people find themselves with less money than they'd like to hold. Not enough money. Their actual money balances are less than their desired money balances. So how do you get more money? Well, there's a number of different ways you can accumulate more money, right? But there's only one of them that you control yourself. What's the one way you can increase? Remember, you're still earning income, but you want to increase the amount of money you have in the bank. What's the one thing you can control to do that? Savings. Okay, so I hear savings on one half, spending on the other. Two ways of saying the same thing. The easiest way to think about it is you can reduce your consumption spending. Okay? If you, if you slow your spending, your bank balance will accumulate, right? And you'll have more money. And so... You can't completely control that because it requires a buyer, right? All the other things you can think about require someone else. Reducing your spending is the one thing you can most easily and completely control, all right? And if people reduce their spending, what happens? Well, imagine the economy full of supply and demand curves, right? All those demand curves start to shift down and in. And here's the key to the story. What the monetary, monetary equilibrium theorists argued is that prices are sticky downward, too. Not because of government interventions, although those are important and make it matters worse. But just because market discovery processes don't instantaneously and accurately bring prices down. This goes under a whole bunch of different names, sometimes called the who's, who goes first problem, because all the, the sellers are hesitant to be the first one to cut their prices for worry that they won't profit from it uh, without their input prices falling and so on. Um, whatever the case may be, we know both empirically and there's theoretical reasons to say that prices won't immediately fall the way, the way that we'd like them to. Okay? And the result, again, imagine supply curves, demand curves, those demand curves start shifting down, the price gets stuck too high for a little while, and the result is that we get quantity adjustments. Right? Fir firms can't sell off all their goods. They can't sell off all their goods at those prices. They see revenues down. They hire less labor. Right? Maybe wages don't fall. So we get all these things happening at once, right? And we begin to see uh, unsold inventory of goods. We also begin to see unsold labor, sometimes called unemployment. Okay? As people's incomes fall, they may shrink their expenditures even further, right? And so on. All the time, there's this downward pressure on prices, but they don't give way right away. And to the extent that they don't give way right away, we get what's sometimes called the Vixellian cumulative rot, okay? Which is... Uh, when, when, when buyers aren't buying, someone else isn't earning income. If someone else isn't earning income, they're not buying. That means someone else is earning income, they're not buying. And the econ if those prices don't unstick, or better yet, the longer it takes for those prices to unstick, the worse this becomes. And certainly government policy can make this much, much worse as it did during the Great Depression, during the early 30s. But even without that, it will take some time for this to unstick itself. And in the meantime, you'll see unemployment, you'll see uh, all the signs of a depressed economy. Just for those of you who are interested, there's links here between this argument and, and sort of the reinterpretations of Keynes associated with Clower and Leonhoff. And I put the question mark next to Keynes because that's always on, under, under debate. The result, one way of thinking about this too, is that under 
monetary, under an excess demand for money, the market rate, unlike the Austrian cycle theory where the market rate's below the natural rate and it leads to the longer capital production and so on, here you've got a market rate that's too high. And instead of forced savings, like in the Austrian cycle theory story, you get forced investment, which is really just firms having unintended inventory accumulation as they can't sell things off. The high market rate makes it look like people are uh, really impatient when they're not. And so producers get a signal that sort of says, people want stuff now, but they really don't. Okay, and since they really don't, we get the, uh, the unintended inventory accumulation. So there's, all, so there's this sort of mirror image between the inflation and deflation story. Last thing I'll mention with deflation, since I'm not going to talk about it in the detail that I will with inflation later on, is that deflation can be uh, problematic uh, in the following way. All the things that, are, that happen as a result of deflation can lead people to demand action from the political process. People see their incomes falling, they see unemployment, they see all these things happening, and they may easily, and again, Great Depression is one example here, turn to the political process to intervene in all kinds of ways that will only make matters worse. You, and again, the other example you might look at, although it's, I, it's not a true, it's not a monetary deflation, just the fall in housing prices <laughs> and how that's impacted people's wealth and the way it's made people ask or demand political relief would be, would be a good example. Okay. Last thing I want to say, and then we'll open for questions, um, is a little bit about the price level. Does monetary equilibrium imply price level stability? No. <laughs> if you're in monetary equilibrium, that is, if you're maintaining that supply and demand for money equality, and doing a decent job of it over time, the price level will move inversely to factor productivity. That is, as the economy gets more productive, as labor and capital get more productive, and we can produce things more efficiently, we should see the price level slowly decline. We saw that in the late 19th century in the United States, a period of relative monetary stability. Okay? Um, and you, can, you, know, you need only think about the ways in which the prices of you know, technology and electronics have declined over time. We should see that across the entire economy. This is what sometimes is called good deflation. And I want to distinguish it from monetary deflation, which is that excess demand for money we were just talking about. And this gets confused in all kinds of popular discussions of deflation, including Austrian ones. Okay? This is okay. okay. And by the way, some people argue that monetary equilibrium theorists you know, always want to, de to avoid deflation, and therefore we want to, say, increase the money supply to offset this. No, no, no. Not at all. This is good. This makes people richer. But notice, where is the fall in the price level coming from? Not from too little money, but from increases in productivity. That's okay. Sector, the fact that productivity changes happen, don't happen across the whole economy, but happen in particular places at particular time, makes it possible for entrepreneurs to uh, sort of incorporate those into their activities and lower prices. You don't have the who goes first problem here because it's not happening to everybody at the same time. It happens in individual markets to individual production processes as we get better and better at doing things. So this is different from the excess demand for money story. One way to think about it is here the falling price level or falling prices is, in, is intended by entrepreneurs. They want to cut prices because they can do it now because their, their, their factors are more productive. It's not a hope for emergent outcome as it is under the excess demand for money scenario. And, there's, and this creates problems about how you get the outcome you'd like to have. But here it's intended, not, not emergent. Um, I'm going to flash this last point, but again, for those of you who know a little bit of monetary theory, um, the falling price level here um, will increase people's income and increase their demand for money. But what it doesn't do is increase the velocity of money. It increases the absolute demand, but not, velo not income velocity. And it's income velocity that matters for maintaining monetary equilibrium. So some critics have said, well, wait a second, won't this cause the demand for money to increase and won't you have to respond to that? No, there's that difference between absolute money demand and income velocity. It's really this that we're talking about. I would, if you're interested in that stuff, in fact, the reading, I'm sure you sure I put it on the reading list, but I have a paper on my website from the Journal of History of Economic Thought from 1996, something like capital theory, inflation, and deflation. This is a really a sort of summary. The second half of this is a summary of that. And if you want to read more, that's worth reading. I think I posted the full version, which has a criticism, and then my response to the criticism, which deals with this issue. And rather than go into detail on that now, I'll let you investigate that on your own time. Whew. 
All right, I'm going to stop there. That's, that's a lot of monetary theory in 65 minutes. So I got time for questions. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. It's better to add uh, uh, money supply. So yes. Still advocating for some kind of monetary authority? Yeah, that's that's a great question. We were just actually discussing this very question back in the among the faculty. Um, the question is, if given a central bank, should the central bank increase the money supply if the demand for money increases? Right? Because one of the things I didn't make the argument here, okay, but let, let me sort of detour back to that question, all right? What the, the question I didn't ask or didn't try to answer is, what monetary system would best maintain monetary equilibrium? Okay. My only answer to that question is that a free banking system, that what a free banking system would do is actually maintain monetary equilibrium. A 100% reserve system, by the way, would not, okay? But the interesting question then is, okay, in the world of the second best, where we have actual central banks, can monetary equilibrium serve as a as a guide to central banks. And here's how I would answer that question. In theory, yes. And in answer to your question, in theory, what the central bank should do, if it knows that the demand for money has risen, it should respond by increasing the money supply, ideally enough to offset that increase in demand. Okay? I'm going to anticipate your butts. <laughs> okay? But wait, hang on. Let me, let me, let me run through, let me run through the, 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 all the butts. Okay? And there's ways that central banks can do that, right? If you know the quantity equation, what we're really saying here is what, what, the, the right, what monetary equilibrium amounts to is stabilizing MV, that M times V should be constant, right? And therefore, actually, I got the chalkboard with me. We can do this, right? That if you think about this, I'm going to use Y, but you can use Q or whatever you want to use, okay? That what we're saying here is that, if, that, that monetary equilibrium amounts to making sure that this stays constant. And Hayek in the 1930s argued for this as the goal of, of a monetary policy. I talked about a constant stream of monetary payments. And what that implies, by the way, of course, is that the right side will stay constant. And another way of viewing that in terms of the productivity norm idea is that as we grow, the price level should fall, right? And this side will stay constant. What central banks can do in theory is target nominal GDP. If the central bank can target this and keep that constant, by implication, it's keeping this constant. So in theory, yeah, that's what the central bank should do. Now question, in practice, can it do this? Mm, not so clear, okay? In practice, can it know when the demand for money has risen? Maybe, maybe not. In practice, can it know how much it's risen? Mm, probably not. In practice, if you give it the power to respond by increasing the money supply, what assurances do we have it will use that power? Only for good. Okay, and if you don't believe that, you can look back to September and October. All right, should Ben Bernanke and the Fed have injected all this liquidity into the banking system? Okay, interesting question. From a monetary equilibrium perspective, the answer might be they should have injected some. Right, it seemed like the demand for money had risen quite a bit, and and the genuine concern that we would have a true monetary deflation was on people's radar, especially Bernanke being a student of the Great Depression. So perhaps he should have done something. Did he overdo it? Hell yes. Okay. And now are we in a big difficulty trying to undo it? Bigger hell yes. Okay. So this is a problem of policy making in the world of the second best. Okay. And, and I don't have, I think there's trade-offs all around here. I think there's, there's, there's uh, situa I, I can imagine situations, last fall being one of them, where I would be willing to say that the central bank needs to respond and should be trying to do this, even though I know there's a pretty significant margin for error. Should it be doing it on a regular basis? Probably not, because the cost of its errors are greater than the cost of its inaction. But perhaps in the fall, and again, I'm, I'm saying perhaps in the fall, the cost of its inaction might have been greater than the cost of its errors at the uh, cost of if, if its errors at the time. Though I think in retrospect, it may well be that it's, again, the degree it was overdone, may well be worse than having done nothing. Had it done the right thing, yeah, but can it do the right? So there's all these kinds of questions. So 
in theory, yeah, this should guide central bank policymakers. But the problem is, central banks as institutions are structurally incapable of getting to this in a reliable way. Are we better off by just instructing the central bank to do nothing, to follow a monetary rule? Perfectly reasonable debate about what the appropriate central bank policy is. Does that a quick follow up? Right. Okay. No, it's not. And here's the difference, okay? You, you, you got to take the central bank out of it for a moment and say, why, if there's an increase in the demand for money, don't, wouldn't we want whomever is in charge of money to produce more money? With hot dogs, okay, what happens? There's an increase in demand for hot dogs. What happens? The price of hot dogs goes up, okay, and, we, and the normal market mechanisms work there. Why? Because we have a price of hot dogs that can adjust when we have a disequilibrium, when we have a change in one of those curves. Think of it that way. With money, there's no one price of money that can adjust. When the demand for money changes, the only way to solve that problem without increasing the money supply is by an economy-wide change in prices. And, and this is the core of the argument, okay? That economy-wide change in prices is highly problematic. Prices don't, can't, the prices, the price level, can't just fall without significant social costs associated with it. And the argument that monetary equilibrium theorists make is that a system, I want to phrase it really carefully, a system under which the, the supply of money could be reliably counted on to respond to those changes in demand would be much preferred over a system in which we allow price levels, the price level to bear the burden of adjustment. Central banks don't do that very well. That's why I, don't, I want to pull the central bank out of your argument. Because once you put the central bank in, then, then, this, then the central banks aren't very good at doing this. Okay? Free banks are. Okay? And the argument, from my perspective, for an, unreg you know, an unregulated free banking system is that it would maintain monetary equilibrium and avoid those other kinds of, avoid those price level, those socially costly price level adjustments. It's the notion that, other, that money has no price of its own. That means that's why you have to make the changes in the nominal quantity, the nominal supply of money, rather than allow the price level to do it. Okay, I know there's been a couple other questions there. Um, right there. You, maybe we need to stage just more of a hypothetical, but do you think um, a free market, a, a free banking uh, money system is susceptible to supply shocks? Uh, uh, so suppose based we, on? Suppose, it, suppose we were on the gold standard. That yeah. was, that, that, that we were right. regulating, but that was okay. just a merge. One of the arguments, one of the concerns people have about free banking system is that it would be again, subject to supply shocks because the supply, because it, yeah. if it was based on gold, and that yeah, I would, that's the kind I would that, prefer. Yeah, that, that if they're changing the supply of gold, that that would have major impacts on the money supply. Yeah. I think the response to that is that historically, um, the systems we know that were closest to free banking were able to survive on actually very small amount of gold in the system. The reserve ratios were very low and, and that wasn't problematic um, for the most part. People were willing, you know, the, the actual demand for hand-to-hand -hand gold wasn't very big because the banking system was reliable and safe and people trusted the liabilities. So when the, when the actual quantity of gold it takes to make the system run effectively is pretty small, um, it's not like gold's going to have a major, going to be a, a major factor. So I think there's, there's some interesting literature on that that suggests it isn't all that susceptible to supply shocks. Yeah, remind me afterwards. Okay. Yeah. This might be a, a silly question, but um, I'm not clear how the free banking systems can maintain the equilibrium. As an individual depositor, my interest is not in this yeah. large equilibrium. It's in um, the safety of my deposits. Yep. It's in not having my deposits going down. So won't competition just drive everyone to not produce more money because people will take their money out of banks that... But that assumes that the increase in the money supply would actually water down the value, the the the, the value of the, of the dollars that individuals are are, are holding, which it won't necessarily it won't if if you're look if if you how do I put this if you want to hold if if you want to hold more money 
okay? And, and, and you're reducing your expenditure in order to do that, okay? And then you're having all these other problematic effects. But the banks respond, which free banks would, by saying, oh, our customers want more of our money, we better produce more. You're not watering down the value of your dollars. You're, per, you're, you're keeping it where it was, right? You're preventing those problematic changes in the price level coming from money. Again, if the drop in the price level comes from us becoming more productive and efficient, the value of your dollars are going to rise. That's good. We shouldn't offset that. But we, but we don't want the value of your dollars to rise because we have a shortage, which is going to cause all these other kinds of problems. And so free banking systems will use the signals within the banking system to respond appropriately. Is that, does that get at your question? Wouldn't I still be better off relative to everyone else if my bank didn't print more notes than anybody else's bank did? If your bank didn't if your bank didn't, pr the bank, the bank, but the bank itself, the bank itself has every has no incentive to not produce those notes. Think of it this way, okay? Um, if you if you start reducing your expenditure and start tr trying to accumulate in your checking account, okay, the signal the bank receives is that its customers want to hold more of its want to, it pr to want it to produce more of its liabilities. The bank says, wow, we can, we can make more loans, produce more dollars, earn more interest. If we stand by and do nothing, we're sacrificing that potential interest we, can learn, we could earn. So when banks, the, this is how the free banking system works, right? When banks, when, when the demand for money rises, banks get a signal that says, people want more of your money. Banks have, there's the signal, they also have the incentive to produce more, which is the interest they can earn by generating that money through the lending process. Okay? I know there's a bunch of hands here. In, uh, in your free banking scenario, are people allowed to discount the value of notes from individual banks? Absolutely. Like, so then, if they're allowed to discount the value of these notes, then I'm not sure the, the demand for holding money that you're talking about seems to me a demand for holding purchasing power. So if, if mm -hmm. changing, if just printing more notes, first of all, assuming that you distribute them equally to everyone, that, so that no one's being no hold, one's hold being that thought, yeah, yeah. But. If, if this is the case, it doesn't seem like you're actually doing anything unless people are deceived about how much you're changing, how much more you're printing. If they're allowed to discount the value of your notes and you double the, the, the nominal number of notes, well, right. then we discount it 50% but nothing has changed. Well, right. But the re two things. I think the, 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 uh, the reason, re to re remember that the individuals who are restricting their expenditure will eventually be successful even if you don't, by restricting their expenditure, their bank accounts really will rise, right? I mean, at some point, right? Either they'll rise and not because they'll get it to someone else, or because prices eventually prices will fall, and the real purchasing power will of those dollars will of their dollars will rise. So eventually, they'll be success, they'll be successful. It right? just seems to me that without deception, there's unless I, without deception, there's nothing that changing the nominal value, you know, the number of notes or anything that, that it affects purchasing power at all, unless. But it, you're but the, the depositors and distributing the new. The new but no, it's, but I don't. But I don't think it's a matter of purchasing power. It's not that. I mean, it is true that 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 the that the money demanders care about the real purchasing power that they're holding. Um, but if they if if, if but they want to hold when velocity falls, they want to hold more dollars relative to their income, right? They so hold purchasing power. right. Well, yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah. Rel but relative. Yeah. Relative. They, they want to hold a bigger percentage of their income as, as money, they're right? Just, they're just feeling like the, 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 what money is buying right now is not... Or, well, it doesn't have to be that. It could, just, it could be also be that, that, that they perceive heightened uncertainty and they want to hold, they want to be more liquid, but right? And that's the same thing as saying that the, the money, that holding that person's power has become more valuable. I mean, if it needs to be like the goods available on the market right now. Yeah, although I, I mean, I, I was thinking of purchasing power more in terms of them wanting to compensate for price changes. But let's let's talk about this some more some more after. I want to make sure I get a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, I have two problems with this, um, and both are like both could be traded. Like, to the theory, I'm running credit. First one, mm -hmm. uh, your your criterion is price level stability. It's not. No, I don't. So no, I don't want to hold the price level stable. So what do you want to, what do you want to MV. hold MV. So you want to hold the value stable, value I, money stable. I want, no, I don't want to hold the value money. I want to hold the, 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 the stream of money, total stream of money payments constant, right? The value of money can change. The value of individual dollars can change, right? But that, then there's just more, 
they're, they're, those are changing hands more quickly or whatever the case, I mean, whichever way, whichever way it goes. What I want to, what monetary, I don't want to make it about me because this isn't just me, what monetary equilibrium theory argues is that M should respond to changes, inversely to changes in V. So if income velocity rises, that is people are, are, are holding money, holding, demanding less money, then we re reduce the money supply, hold this constant. That allow, if you hold this constant, that implies not price level stability at all. You don't, I mean, the argument here is not to offset changes in the price level, but with, with the money supply, but to offset changes in velocity. So let's say you have a perfect central bank that, that, that will do the policy as well as it, like, yeah. is supposed to be done. Like, would the central bank, like, what? What should it follow, or what should it do? What should it look at? T I mean, the, the what the argument that what again, monetary monetary equilibrium theorists. Yeah, criteria. yeah, I understand what you're saying. Monetary equilibrium theorists disagree on this, but the dominant position is to tell the central bank to target nominal GDP, to hold this constant. If you hold this constant, by implication, you're doing this. Holding this constant. I mean, we, holding this constant, right? Or tar holding this constant, probably want to target this is the better word. Okay, if you target this, that means as the economy grows, let the price level fall. So it's not targeting. It's not. I want to make that really clear. This position is not if, targeting price level stability. The book to read on this is George Selgin's book, Less Than Zero, that who, and where he makes this case in great detail. This is not a price stability argument. This is an argument for stabilize for 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 holding this constant or targeting nominal GDP and allowing the price level to move inverse to productivity. What, what concerns monetary equilibrium theorists, and this is why the hot dog question is such a good question, what concerns monetary equilibrium theorists is offsetting potential changes in the price level, is, level that, come, that have a monetary source. All right? And the concern is you cannot isolate changes in the demand for money or change in the supply of money to one market. The effects will always be systematic and pervasive. Increases or decreases in demand for money or if the bank decides to lower or raise the, 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 the money supply if it's a central bank. Those will always be pervasive. We want to offset those, not per se because because we want to target price level stability, but we don't want the, pro because we know there's problems associated with allowing the price level to bear the burden of adjustment when you have monetary disequilibria, right? That's the key point. It's perfectly fine to allow the price level to fall as we get more productive, or conversely, you know, uh, you know, we get a whole bunch of 9-11 attacks or something and destroys a lot of infrastructure. Yeah, price level should rise. Let it rise. Stuff's more scarce, okay? That's, that's, that's the story there. I can think we have time for maybe two more, one and two. So. Okay. Well, I, personally, I, I think that um, the, the biggest experiment we had in, in private banking and in this type in the United States in the early 19th century proved very uh, uh, damaging to uh, individuals' uh, uh, income and resources, and uh, all around here. Um, Anyway, I, I can't go into yeah. that much detail. I just finished writing a paper about it. But, and, uh, but what, what I see this as is, first of all, I have several problems. First of all, exactly defining what Y is, exactly oh, defining sure. what P is, exactly defining what M is, and trying to, to do all these finaglings instead of just is, is problematic. And, and one, this is one of my biggest um, I can, I can see a free market solution to this, but this is one of my biggest things about what government should really do, and that's prevent fraud and, mo and money. And, and that when people have a certain amount of money, they should only be able to loan out that amount of money. They shouldn't be able to uh, loan out additional, like just, just like the basic coin, and making the coin worth less and less. When you increase the, the money supply in fractional reserve banking, then it's masked because you have increasing productivity over time because people are making technological advancements and their goods are increasing. But, but what happens is the people who are the money lenders transfer money and wealth to themselves, transfer wealth, uh, yeah. actual value of, of goods and production to themselves and away from poor people on, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on limited or like a state on a steady income where they can't they can't change it anymore. And and 
I don't see any problem with deflation at all. I mean, I know that they've got this idea about if it goes down below mm -hmm. a certain point, then you have all you know, the earthquake, you know, the, the Y2K will happen, and all the everybody's computers will stop and everything like that. But all I see is that when your prices go down, prices go down, everybody benefits. And there's no reason to worry about having to pay the people to take their money because there's always a time preference of money. So well, the interest will never go below zero. Right, I, I think you're... So it's, I just think yeah. it's a big shimmer. And well, it's to keep people involved in messing with the money supply and, and giving, uh, having a need for centralized banking or, or even for, uh, allowing people to do all this money for anything like John Law and everybody in this... I think that's really, I think that last part in particular is a really unfair characterization of, of the argument here. Let me go back to the first part, okay? First of all, I, I think the, the, the supposed unregulated banking of the early 19th century was not unregulated at all. It was very heavily regulated in all kinds of ways. And there's all kinds of historical research, some of which is my own, looking at the banking systems, the state level banking systems and the, and the federal banking system in the 19th century. That, yeah, I know the the so this yeah eighteen thirty yeah I know yeah I, and again there, there's look there's always fraud out there okay but 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 to the the kind of I, I think what free banking folks are talking about is a very different thing than the systems we've seen any system we've seen historically at least in the United States other countries have had systems much closer I think you should look at some of that the historical work done like by the, the free Scottish bankers system. that and there's some and there's some a number of yeah, other examples. Scottish. Well, and that's, I think that's a, di I think, I think there's a different argument there. And the whole question of whether fractional, uh, the question of whether, fra the question of whether fractional reserve banking is inherently inflationary or inherently fraudulent as a whole is another set of questions. I don't think it is either one, okay? I don't think it's inherently inflationary. I don't think it's inherently fraudulent. And in fact, uh, I mean, you said government's role should be to prevent uh, people from, from defrauding using money. Government's the biggest defrauder of all when it comes to money. Right. And I agree, too. Okay. And so, so that's why, you know, the, the, your characterization at the end of what free banking, that, to sort of compare it to John Law and all that stuff, that's, the, that's not what this is about. Okay. Uh, and the argument, I think, you know, if you read what the free banking theorists have to say, their argument is that this system would, in fact, prevent the kinds of problems, exactly the you're concerned with, would be better at preventing inflation and deflation, unless you simply want to define inflation as, as per fractional reserve banking or any increase in the money supply. Once you define it that way, then, then, then there's no, you, 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 the discussion here becomes problematic, because you've, def, you've defined away the possibility that, that adjustments in the money supply could be, could be justified. So I, 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 let me let the last question get in, then we need to take a break. I was at the uh, Smithsonian Museum of American History a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C., and they have an exhibit there that talks about the history of money in the United States. Mm -hmm. The primary argument that they, that they made for the reason that we went to a fiat currency system was because there wasn't enough metal in supply yeah. to cover the economy. Yeah. So this is, so this is propaganda. I, yeah. So how much money is not amenable? And they, they, the problem that we have is when we argue with socialists in Washington, D.C., my buddy and I, yeah. they're always saying, well, when we have the California gold rush, yeah. you know, that that was yeah. a huge inflation money. So why yeah. have centralized authority in, uh, where humans can control the inflation rather than, than <laughs> some natural causes where as you have a huge gold fund yeah. that it creates humongous inflation. As if, you, as if humans have been so good at controlling inflation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that the answer to that question is, again, on, uh, if you look at historically at the systems that have run on fractional reserves and run well without bank failures and so on, like the Scottish system that was mentioned, again, this is now 250 years old, but they ran successfully on about a 3% reserve ratio uh, 250 years ago, okay, with, with near zero failures. I would, again, I'm just guessing today, but I'm, I'm imagining you could run a gold standard-based fractional reserve banking system today with banks holding well under 1%. Uh, in, of, against their liabilities in actual gold. Now, again, if you think free ba if you think fractional reserve banking is inherently fraudulent or inflationary, that's not going to be impressive. That that's going to be a problem. Okay, but I, but that's not my position. Um, so I don't I don't work. That's not. There's plenty. Look, the United States government has plenty of gold in Fort Knox, right? If they just put it up for sale, okay, uh, you know, be not not a problem at all to run a free banking system based on gold. The, now, if you want to talk about a 100% reserve banking system where every dollar of money has to be backed fully by gold, then you've got, you need a different quantity of gold and you've got all kinds of other questions that come in. But again, we can talk about that, you know, over break or in discussion groups or whatever, because we are at time. Wait, one, okay, go ahead. You can applaud first and then one quick announcement.